resourcescholarsshow.com. Because we are the ones who had been forced to work the black man had. And so part of that destruction, doing all that Jim Crow and everything, was fighting against the brothers who were trying to be in business and who were trying to work. And that fight between the black man and the white man about the construction business has continued down to the day. Log on to resourcescholarsshow.com. In New York and Philadelphia, blacks own less than 20% of the cabs. Government licensing closes the door to economic opportunity. Nearly a thousand occupations in the United States exclude people who do not have licenses. Sometimes the licenses cost money. Sometimes they require the applicant to pass complicated tests that have little to do with the job. Sometimes getting a license requires a friend in the business. All those licensing laws do just one thing, keep outsiders out. Those outsiders are often members of minority groups. Uh, back during the 30s and 40s, uh, there were practices uh, that, that were rampant in the South, particularly uh, in uh, the, uh, the former slaveholding states, uh, where blacks were specifically excluded by predominantly white unions. Example, electricians unions, plumbers unions, railroad firemen unions, and at that time, uh, the, the records of history will demonstrate that uh, it was the purpose of white unions to exclude uh, blacks, uh, mi uh, minorities in general, from the workplace. Uh, in fact, there were statements specifically made in connection with uh, occupational licensing regulations that if this law is successful, it will have the effect of reducing to a minimum the involvement of blacks, or Negroes as they were called then, in the workplace. This is the Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Washington, D.C. Back in 1880, when Washington was still a segregated city, this beautiful building was built by black artisans, black plumbers, carpenters, and masons. And mind you, all working under black supervision. So are many other important public buildings in this city and in cities throughout the South. Today, that sounds remarkable. Even now, black people have a hard time breaking into the skilled construction trades. The fact is, in the late 1800s, black people were better represented in many of the skilled trades than they are today. Today, such blatant racism is illegal, and many union leaders would like to see more black workers in union jobs. But again, good intentions don't always produce good results. The effect of the government endorsing uh, collective bargaining and the closed shop concept within the union movement was that it uh, basically locked in place to a large degree for a generation or two to come uh, white domination of unions. And when you confer upon a union in effect monopoly rights to bargain collectively for the entire workforce, uh, they in effect can lay out the conditions, they can set the price uh, for their labor, uh, and they can control entrance uh, to that particular industry. Restrictive labor laws are just like minimum wages in some ways. In effect, they force inexperienced workers to charge more for their labor and thus keep them from competing for jobs. There are many examples, but one of the most infamous is the Davis-Bacon Act. Passed in the racist days of 1931, but still in force today. The Davis-Bacon Act is a 50-year-old law passed during the Depression, the purpose of which was to prevent employers from undercutting wages at a time when it was very much a seller's market in employment, a very high unemployment rate, and it was a Worker Protection Act. Now, it's very much outdated today because the Davis-Bacon Act, 50 years later, has become a Union Protection Act. The net effect of the Davis-Bacon Act today is that it favors union construction firms. Most blacks are in non-union construction firms or are independent tradesmen. Davis-Bacon excludes them from most government contracts. Was the Davis-Bacon Act of 1931. And the Davis-Bacon Act says that all workers in federally funded or federally assisted construction projects must be paid the prevailing wage. And if you look on page 6513 of the Congressional Record on March 31st, 1931, you'll, you'll see congressional testimony where congressmen will say, see that contract over there? He brings cheap colored labor up from the South, puts them in cabins, and it's labor of that sort that has to compete, that white Americans are competing against. 
It was all kinds of testimony in support of the Davis-Bacon Act that, that, was, that demonstrated mm. that they wanted to keep blacks out of construction. Wow. And see, the tragedy of it is that the Davis-Bacon Act is still on the books today. And, and, and uh, another part of the tragedy is that black congressmen, they also support the Davis-Bacon Act. Now, they support the Davis-Bacon Act because unions want the Davis-Bacon Act. Now, the, the people who support the Davis-Bacon Act today, they just don't use the same rhetoric. They use a more enlightened rhetoric mm. in support uh, of the Davis-Bacon Act. Become a member and add to the Resource Scholar social media community. I, mean, I, I would probably said that, I probably would have simply said that uh, the game was rigged, uh, the DAC was stacked. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is a way of a way of breaking through all that. You know, this low bid thing is a race to the bottom, and it favors the people who, who, who previously have had contracts. And, right. and the low bid, you know, you got you you already get a head start if you go in the low bid because you've already had all the uh, expertise and resources to be able to do the work, mm -hmm. and so therefore you have to go to a different method. And it, the old saying is, you keep doing the same thing and and asking for different results. That's you know that's crazy. So. Anyway, uh, that's real good. What opportunities uh, do you foresee, uh, particularly for black people in, in this uh, Rose Quarter project? Uh, and, 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 and I understand the process of being certified is really uh, difficult. So tell us a little bit about that process and what, what, what's gonna happen on the certification end of this piece? How, do you, how does one get certified? Well, so, I mean, e even so, even the certification, which is which is it, it's a significant amount of paperwork. It requires that you so you have to prove that you're uh, a person of color and that you're economically disadvantaged. And the way that you do that is you have to have your um, basically your taxes and and you fill out a bunch of paperwork um, to prove that you're economically disadvantaged and that you're a person of color or a woman. And in the case of the Rose Quarter, we will be having upcoming workshops where the team can help firms get certified. Now, in terms of your question about, uh, about opportunities, I want the community to understand what these mega projects can do. So James, you and I worked on the Interstate Max project 20 years ago, and I asked the, the community to remember, for those of you that don't know what that project was about, it was a $300 million uh, mega project. And, and again, in that case, the same diversity director that we have on this project is was the project manager for that one. We had... $35 million went into the hands of minority contractors, many of which were black contractors. And the state were using similar strategies here, which is it's it's so many different things. $160 million in opportunities for contractors here. Don't just think about contractors, think about we have if we're building a project, we have to have an event, which means we need an event planner, which means we need a printer. There are black printers, there are black event planners. All of those companies also have workers. So there are goals for the for the DBE companies, namely 18 to 22% goal, which will be about 160 million. And then we get a second bite at the apple with the workforce. We will also have a workforce goal of 25% uh, minority male and 15% female, of which we have indicated that we will disaggregate the data by race. Log on to resourcescholarshow.com. Build 1,500 miles of road in eight months through the Alaskan Canadian wilderness? You're kidding, right? But that is exactly what happened. In response to the attack on Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt authorized the construction of a road to Alaska. The effective defense of Alaska is of paramount importance to the defense of the continent 
Alaska is most exposed to an attempt by the enemy to establish a foothold in North America. The following year, after basic training in construction engineering, 11,000 men shipped north. More than a third came from three all-black regiments, the 93rd, the 95th, and the 97th Engineers. Black soldiers were rarely sent into combat, but rather were put into labor battalions at lower pay. The Alaska assignment was an unprecedented opportunity for pay and benefits equal to those of white soldiers. And black and white units were to work on the same project. That was practically unheard of. Work commenced in the winter of 1942, in five directions at once, paired units working independently. Conditions in the north were always harsh, and this was the coldest winter on record. Lord, it was bitter cold. If you touch anything metal with your bare hands, you couldn't tear your skin loose. Clifton Monk. Leather would freeze. We'd take galoshes, rubber galoshes, we called them arctics, and we'd wear three full pairs of socks. We'd double up on pants. Corporal Donald Nolan. For months on end, I couldn't get a real night's sleep. I had nightmares I was freezing to death. Unidentified soldier. Summer wasn't much better. Trucks sank in melting permafrost, and giant mosquitoes dive-bombed in droves. The black engineers faced other challenges. General Simon Bolivar Buckner, head of the Alaska Defense, ordered the black soldiers confined to camp so they wouldn't socialize with locals. Even more frustrating, despite the superior training and experience of the 95th Black Engineers, their heavy equipment had been given to a less qualified unit. As a crowning blow, the Black Engineers were then supposed to improve the safety and durability of a road built by that same white unit. To build morale, their commander gave them a challenge. Build a bridge over the fast-moving, 300-foot-wide Sikany Chief River. This is going to be difficult. Take at least five days, maybe more. Are you up for it, men? Piece of cake. Oh, bet my paycheck we can do it in four. Yeah, man. Sure we can do it. Using only hand tools, they prepared the beams and plunged chest deep into the freezing water to set the trestles. Working round the clock, they finished ahead of schedule. Work on the highway continued. Eight months after construction started, the road was complete. Many in the military had doubted African-American engineers were up to the job. I took a part in building what was considered one of the greatest engineering projects during the last century. Some people said it was sucking only to the Panama Canal. And we did it in record time before they said we could do it. It's taken 63 years for those people to realize that they had the best crew of men that they could have selected. After the highway's completion, many of the black engineers were sent to active duty in Europe and the South Pacific, where they again performed superbly, negating the argument that African Americans were unfit for battle. Finally, in 1948, after pressure from leaders and veterans in the African-American community, President Truman desegregated the armed forces, bringing greater equality to the military. But racial discrimination was still very much alive in the rest of America. Log on to resourcescholarshow.com. Can anybody speak to what is being done to continue to tackle systemic racism? Because it appears it continues to be a challenge in this industry. I'd like to, uh, to answer that question and, and also uh, make note of the racially, um, racially no, uh, the, the nooses that were found on the site as well, uh, Dwight. Uh, um, so basically, um, these are heinous uh, crimes that were, were committed against the black community. And uh, um, it's very saddening at this day and age that this sort of thing is happening in such a diverse society that we live in, in, in the greatest country in the world, Canada. And, um, you know, uh, on behalf of our business manager, Steve Martin, and our elected officer of IBW Local 353, we denounce all acts of racism and harassment, especially these recent uh, acts towards the black community in the construction industry. And, and these acts are forbidden and against our principles and policies. Uh, um, 
you know, they're hurtful and uh, they harm a community and, and hold them back. And no one should be held back in this country, regardless of race, color, gender, anything. And um, it's important to know that uh, we as union leaders um, stand for multiculturalism, diversity, inclusion, and that we bring people of all these uh, categories into our union and give them equal opportunity and this is despite of who they are, right? And that's the purpose of a union. And where else in a union can you get people of color, race, religion, um, gender, and have a platform of equal policies, equal uh, um, treatment um, in Canada? And that's beautiful. And, and we have to keep working on that. It's very important. Uh, our business manager asked us to uh, join Daniel's group, uh, uh, in uh, morning stand downs at, at some of the job sites and we went out and uh, spoke to all the members uh, with our policies and reaffirmed in them what a great country we live in and, and how diverse we are and that you know our blood is all red and that same blood was spilled on the ground when we were fighting for the freedom in this country by all races and genders and we need to remember that Canada Day and Remembrance Day are two important days we need to celebrate every day. It reaffirms who we are and who has fought for this country. And everybody should be recognized for that. Uh, you know, uh, we, uh, we also, at the beginning of our, our union meetings, uh, have an equity and harassment policy we read before every meeting to make sure everyone sitting in that meeting understands they are welcome, they are equal, and they have a say. Is it surprising then when you, know, you hear a talk like that? Because after we ran the story of the nooses, so many people reached out to our newsroom and said, Dwight, this is not uncommon, that these things are happening and have been happening for a long time. So, um, Dwight, um, when, when this happened, it, it, it really struck a chord with the, the leadership here at Ellis Don. And um, the, after listening, to the employees, specifically to the racialized employees, um, Elistan took a three-pronged approach to uh, address this, and it was okay. stamping out systematic racism at Elistan. So first, acknowledging that there is systematic racism and how, what to do with it. Two, how to support the black community. And three, how to change the industry. Um, under those three goals, there are a lot of initiatives that are being worked on from when it, whether it's communication or recruitment practices, the messaging on our sites, partnering with um, black organizations or other um, BIPOC organizations, and, you know, frankly, looking at things like possibly putting word uh, verbiage in our contracts and MSAs with recruiters about bringing in diverse candidates and, 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 and possibly downloading some of that owner's onus onto uh, our subcontractors. I mean, that's, we're, we're really looking at those uh, options very, very, very seriously, right? Now. Um, the, the, the key is though, is in the end, you have to expand the diversity within the company. I can guarantee you right now, if, there were more people of color around, there would probably be less incidents like this because people would be less apt to act a certain way. So part of the solution is get, get diversity into your company. Well, you're segueing right into our next topic because we do want to talk about recruitment next. And also, we're hoping that we will get some closure to some of these incidents because we know investigations are continuing and uh, we are hoping to hear from law enforcement if they have figured out who's doing this and if any arrests or anything like that has been made. Let, let's go to recruiting practices next. And I'm going to throw some of these questions out to specifically to, to Rhonda, Patience, and Ivan. Um, if somebody could start with what your company or union is doing to increase diversity, like we just talked about, what are some of the, the practices your organization has as, as it pertains to recruitment? Um, hi, Dwight, can I speak to that? This is Rhonda Davis. 
Um, when I started 20 years ago, honestly, I didn't think Daniels was diverse. But over the years, I have seen advancements. I'm very proud to say, and it's nice to see, that currently we have a diverse workforce on construction sites, as well as in the office. As an organization, we have been taking an active role in increasing diversity and recruitment. There is always room to do better, and Daniels plans to actively convene and participate in discussions to critically examine how we can do that. For starters, we are posting jobs where we are more likely to recruit diverse inv individuals. For example, for 14 years, we have worked with Toronto Employment and Social Services, Toronto Community Housing and Community Partners in Regent Park on a local employment strategy for the revitalization. Through this program, residents in Regent Park, many of them from the Black community, have found employment throughout the GTA at Daniels, as well as with our trade contractors and consultants. I think it's important to note that a number of the Regent Park residents that have gained employment are union members today. I can honestly say that I have seen firsthand how this drastically changed lives and changed people's mindsets about themselves, giving them the confidence to see what they can accomplish. We're also working with agencies to recruit diverse candidates and having conversations around unconscious bias with hiring managers. We are asking for internal referrals from our employees, which remain a diverse set of individuals. This all gets us to the point where learning about different cultures, opening ourselves up to people of diverse backgrounds, and really getting to know each other makes for a more positive, interesting, and fun workplace. We learn that we have lots in common, and, it's all, and it also helps us grow and advance as individuals and as a company. Over the past three years, we've seen a significant increase in Black and racialized team members in our organization. Um, we have a long way to go when it comes to recruiting Indigenous team members, um, and we're continuing to work on that. Thank you, Rana. Could um, Patience or um, Ivan jump in now? And something else I want to touch on, hopefully, is are you seeing a change in the percentage of Black, Indigenous, or, or racialized workers in these companies, in these unions, in your years in this industry? Are we seeing improvement? If I may, um, so from, from an ACOM perspective, we have been uh, pretty, we, we have kind of stuck, uh, 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 we have made some moves to, to do things. Uh, we are not really uh, assuming that everyone is, is equal, right? I think some of us have been talking about, oh, everyone is equal, everyone is equal. Everyone is not equal in, in, in the way that the Canada is set up right now, right? We are kind of operating in, anti, in an anti-Black racist system and a um, and and that's that's the that's the reality. So what Acon has done is design programs to make sure that we are absolutely creating space, putting our elbows up, and pushing out for women, for Indigenous folks. I don't really have to talk too much about it because Acon does have a pretty good reputation when it comes to our work with some Indigenous nations across the country. So we do have joint venture projects. One is called Acon Six Nations. One is called Enoch Acon, which is 51% owned by Indigenous communities and 49% owned by Acon. In terms of with women, um, we have um, deliberately set aside entire cohorts of training programs in partnership with Layuna for women, only women. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, we're not there yet. Log on to resourcescholarshow.com. What, what does uh, business owners need to do to know about the different agencies and so forth in order to, to be prepared for this project, this Rose Quarter and any other projects that ODOT is doing? So I would recommend that they keep, you know, one, keep track of our, our website. And on the, the website for the Rose Quarter project is um, uh, information related to the JV so that they can contact the JV. Um, the other thing is, uh, you know, ODOT is also looking for other ways to create opportunities. There's um, an I-205 project, which will have uh, similar diversity plan goals like, like this project. To your point, James, what's unique about this is that 
you know, the community should not just think about construction. It's not, it's, it's all of the other ancillary services that, that are involved with a project, a transportation project. It's um, communications. It's, we have a social black, Portland Black Excellence, which is developing social media to put information about about the project. There's just so many things that that will re- result in contracting opportunities or jobs. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you this quick question: Is there a place you can go and look uh, uh, on a website somewhere where people can look at the traditional jobs? Uh, we, we typically want to talk about NACE codes and so on that they've used on various projects. People need to understand what a NACE code is and, and, and so they can get a, a kind of a vision about uh, mm-hmm. how this project works. And, uh, uh, but, but before I go there, I just want to say this real quick. Uh, this is very, very important. Typically, the, uh, these contracting arrangements or dog eat dog. In other words, the people above you want to get as much dollars out of the contract for their profit and uh, forget about the rest of the people below them. In contrast to that, this contractor, especially Jeff Moreland and Ray Moore, are, are trying to make sure that there's profitability for everyone that works on this project, not just taking all the money and running themselves. They're going to really try to uh, you know, use these, uh, this project to build capacity, uh, build wealth, as it were. Uh, that's a kind of interesting term. But to build, help build wealth, wealth is what I should say, because this is one of the few, if any, projects where uh, the goal is not necessary for you to take all the money and go home as a, as a prime contractor or a high-level sub. So that's, people should keep that in mind. You're almost guaranteed to make money on this project. Uh, it won't be the regular dog eat dog uh, scenario that we see out here in the industry. Yeah, I mean, so let's talk about a little bit about that. So, um, okay, so one, using the CMGC procurement method allows the JV to select, uh, you know, firms that have never done ODOT work. It also includes uh, what is called a mini CMGC program. What's that? As, you know, as a person of color, I don't want to just have to be a sub. I want to become a prime. I want to learn how to be a prime. And so, yes, sometimes I want to be sub, sometimes I want a prime, but I need to learn those skills. So this also will include many CMGC priming opportunities. Let's to say, build- say, you know, that acronym CMGC, you tell them what that really means. Uh, you know, I mean, I, want, I, I apologize for stopping you, but our audience may not understand what that means. So explain that real quickly. Sure. So mini CMGC is a mini contract management general contractor. So what is a CMGC? So, Let's suppose this, this is the CM contract management. This is the GC or general contractor. The idea is that you take the design team or the architectural and engineering team, which is the contract manager, and you pair them with the contractor or the constructor, which is the construction manager. And then by putting that team together, you get a better transportation project. And so what this will do is it will allow DBEs to be mini CMGCs. What does that mean? It means that they will get chunks of work that are bigger chunks of work that they have probably ever performed. And these are priming opportunities that will allow them to do bigger chunks of work, new scopes of work to allow them to be primes on other projects. They get to run their own crews and they have mentoring and wraparound services so that when they do this new work, that they are successful in doing the work.
resourcescholarshow.com.